So uh, I'm recording just this section. Um, I, um, so I'll give you a little introduction about myself and let you know why we're recording this section here today. Mountain Man Medical has name brand proven trauma medical supplies with a price match guarantee to ensure you get the right gear at the right price. Check them out at get-asp.com slash mountain man. So my name is Carrie Dudenhofer and I'm from Eastern Washington State and I've the, I'm the wife of one for 29 years now and uh, the mom of seven. And uh, we have three of our kids I happen to share DNA with and four of them we bought. One of them we bought in China and the other three were a buy one, get two free deal out of Detroit, Michigan. They were a sibling group and uh, they're all phenomenal kids. I, I, I get to spend my days doing what I never imagined I would ever want to do or ever imagine that I would find so much fulfillment in, but I love getting to be at home and be a wife and mom. Uh, we homeschool our kids. Uh, so far, everybody's doing okay. Uh, people are able to talk to other people and they can chew gum and walk at the same time. Most of the time, I, however, can't. Um, they do, uh, people ask us all the time, you know, what about socialization? And I say, I know, what about it? We do so much of it, we barely have time to get school done for crying out loud. <laughs> so we have a good time, but, um, I would tell you about my family because they're the reason that I do this. They're the reason that I was so desperate to figure out how to protect myself and my children. And that started for me uh, the, the very first night I was home alone with our first child when she was born. That was over 25 years ago now. And I remember sitting up at night, my husband worked nights at uh, the emergency room in downtown Spokane at that time. And uh, that first night I was home alone with her was long for a lot of reasons. <laughs> first of all, because I was a new mom trying to figure this whole thing out. <laughs> uh, but second of all, because I heard noises and sounds and had thoughts that I had not ever had before. That, hmm, I wonder what that could be. Geez, what happened if somebody broke into here? I'm sure part of it was hormone related, being postpartum and that sort of thing. But either way, it was a catalyst for me to realize that this tiny, precious little thing uh, is exclusively dependent on me. That was a sobering thought for me. And uh, I don't know why it took me that long to figure it out, but uh, I tend to be one of those people, unfortunately, if it's right in front of me, I think about it, and if it's not, then I might not think about it for a little bit. But it was right in front of me, and there she was looking at me. And you know how innocent and precious they are, right? And I just, there was nothing or nobody, I was not gonna let anybody do anything to hurt her. So my husband got home that morning, bless the man, he was exhausted after a 12 hour shift. And I said, honey, do we have anything here at home that I could use to protect Haley if I had to? And he said, well, yes. Uh, we do. I'm like, well, what do we have and where is it? And he said, I'll, I'll happily show you where it is. Maybe something to think about is, have you thought, would you be able to actually use a firearm to protect yourself or Haley, which could result in somebody's demise or being seriously hurt? And I had to pause and think for a minute about that. And I said, you know, I think I could. If, if they were trying to hurt Haley, I think I could. I don't think I'd even be worried about it in the moment, to be quite honest with you. But gosh, if it were just me by myself, if Haley weren't here, like if she was with my mom or you know, with my husband off somewhere, I wasn't quite sure that I'd be able to do that because my thinking at the time, and I thought I was just so wise for thinking this, my thinking at the time was, well, you know, I, my belief system is I know where I'm going when this gig here is over and it's a whole lot better than this place. And not that I'm super anxious to get there, especially after just having our first child, um, but I was looking forward to being there to getting there. And uh, my thought was, well, if something happened to me, um, I know where I'm going, and that would give an aggressor a chance to, you know, be apprehended and tried and convicted. It was all just so smooth in my mind. And they would go to jail, and they'd be in prison, I'm sure, probably the state penitentiary for a long time. But there, they would, there'd be a prison ministry of some kind. They would reach them and help them learn. Uh, about going where I believe I'm going and about eternal life and the way for that to happen. And um, I shared that with my husband and uh, he said, I get it. And thankfully, I don't know if he actually got it or not, but he was very patient with me. And uh, he said, what would happen if, if something happened to you, but you didn't die? What if you were you know, horrifically beaten or victimized in some way? And I was like, oh, well, geez, I didn't really think about that. He said, and that'd be awfully hard to, you know, parent Haley. And, and, and if, you, if you did die, well, what about her? She's going to have to grow up without a parent. And people have to do that all the time, right? But life is easier on this earth most of the time for most people if they have two parents or two adults in their life to help guide them. Um, so that was the beginning for me of realizing that 
I needed to spend some time thinking about this before I made a, a decision that absolutely I can do this because I wasn't sure if I could. And for me, it was a bit of a process. And for a lot of people, it is. And that's okay. Um, that's why uh, I think it's great that we have conferences like this where people can come and learn and grow and develop and um, you know have some of their thinking and beliefs challenges, which my husband helped me think of and realize it. Since then, I've learned a lot about our criminal justice system, especially since I've been doing expert witness work in it the past couple of years. Um, but I've learned that it isn't always that easy and it isn't always that cut and dry. And oftentimes, somebody that's um, involved in a, uh, by all parameters and by all expert witness accounts, uh, involved in a justified righteous defensive use of force, uh, they go to prison, sometimes for a long time. And someone else that's involved in a not righteous justified use of force situation, it's not, or I shouldn't say not righteous, not justified, but involved in a situation that is not at all a righteous use of force, they're just trying to victimize somebody or take something from them or what have you, they might not have any consequences or very minimal consequences. And uh, that's been, I think, a good thing for me to learn. Sometimes people might say, thank you for being so kind and <laughs> not looking at me like I'm an idiot because oftentimes when I share this in my classes, people look at me like, I can't believe that you teach people how to protect themselves with a firearm and you thought that stuff, um, but I did. Um, and I find a lot of my students do also. A lot of my students wrestle with these topics. They're big topics. And I, I believe that um, we aren't inherently designed to make it, or I, don't, I believe that it's not inherently easy for most of us to just think about life as if it's nothing and to know, oh, right, oh, yeah, I can absolutely take care of that person. If that person is a threat to me and mine, that changes everything, right? And that, we don't usually have to think a lot about that. But if that person isn't, or if we're thinking of other circumstances, sometimes it's a lot to think of, and I think it's good for all of us to have a chance to think about that. So anyway, that's why I started teaching classes. Uh, I start, well, actually, when I started taking, after my husband, sorry, I'll go back up a little bit. After uh, my husband and I had a couple very helpful discussions and I did a lot of thinking, I realized I really did need to learn more, and I wanted to understand it a little bit more, especially the legalities of it. That concerned me a lot, because I don't know that I'd be able to live with myself if I did something that, you know, was unjustified or, or wrong. And it seemed like such a quick thing that could happen. So um, I started reading books and I looked for training in our area and there just wasn't much. Uh, as a matter of fact, at that time there was not even an, a range in our area and I could only find training uh, even within a two state radius that was uh, available and it was usually taught by military and law enforcement. And I have no problem with any of that. Uh, my dad's law enforcement, um, I grew up, most of his friends are, were and are still in law enforcement. Um, so nothing against law enforcement at all, nothing against military. I just couldn't see at the time how that applied to me because those folks are amazing. They're running to danger. They're running toward the sounds of gunfire. I would not be doing that at all unless my kid was right there in the middle of it and then I would be going to get her. I would be running away from danger, away from the sounds of gunfire. I would not be open carrying. Uh, I would be concealed carrying. And so I just had a hard time understanding how those went together. So I didn't train for a number of years, but I began to get more and more and more concerned um, as we had more and more kids. <laughs> and I realized when kid number three was born that I could no longer pick up kid number one, kid number two, and kid number three and run and carry them. Because I, not joking, I, you can ask people that used to be our neighbors back then, um, I would practice in the backyard of our house, picking up the first two and then picking up the baby in the car seat and running with them. And I carried little Smarties in my pockets and in the diaper bag and had them tucked down in the bottom of the car seat because they'd melt really quickly, the little Smarty candies, so that I could keep a kid quiet if I had to, if something happened. So I was thinking about it, right? But my thinking was a little bit flawed that I thought that, oh, of course, I'll be fine. I'll just pick them up and run. It never occurred to me that somebody could actually outrun me and especially <laughs> somebody carrying three kids. Um, so you see, my thinking wasn't always accurate. Um, but once our third kid was born, um, just two months after he was born, there was a horrible incident that happened just outside of Spokane, and it was in Wolf Lodge, Idaho, and the family was sleeping uh, in their home, uh, which is the place I felt the safest, was at home with my kids and my husband, all of us together. That felt safe to me. Um, and this family was in that same situation. It was a mother and a father and a 13-year-old son, and aggressor had been surveilling them for a few days, broke into their home and bludgeoned to death the mother and the father and the 13-year-old son and abducted the seven-year-old and nine-year-old and took them into the Lolo National Forest where he horrifically, horrifically abused them. He killed the seven-year-old in the process and the nine-year-old, a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, young girl, Indian woman, um, 
she was able to manipulate him, and I mean that in the best of terms, to get him to take her back home. And he did eventually take her back home. He made good on what he told her she, he would do. And she was rescued, uh, thankfully, by a, a waitress who saw something and she said something. And what she saw didn't look right to her. She wasn't 100% sure what it was, but she made a phone call and that saved uh, Shasta Groni's life. When that happened, and I realized that the place I felt safest might not be the safest necessarily, or might not always be the safest, that that might just be an illusion, that's what really propelled me. And I would talk to my dad about it a lot, and he would say, kid, listen, if you're this worried, which obviously you are, because you've been asking about this for a long time, just go get some training. Go get some training. And so the nearest training facility to where I was at the time was uh, Thunder Ranch in Southern Oregon. So that's where I took my first uh, life fire formal class with um, Mr. Clint and Miss Heidi Smith at Thunder Ranch. And I learned a ton and I uh, had a great time. And that started the hit, lit the fire for me. Because once that fire was lit, I wanted to know everything. I wanted to know why do some trainers say that you should reload here? And why do some trainers say you should reload here? And why do some say you should inboard manipulate the slide? And why do others say you should overhand manipulate the slide? I wanted to know all that. Why do some people say you should stand this way? And some people say you should stand that way? I wanted to understand all of that. And I wanted to train with the people. We live in what I call the golden age of firearm training. I could be completely wrong in that, but that's what it seems like to me.